Oh crap. So, once you're over that oh crap moment, Airfield you've got a serious there. situation to deal with. Oh, and when crap. it all goes quiet up front, you need to focus all your experience and training into what could be Go the most important restart. landing you will ever make. So, join me today as together we look at surviving an engine failure in a single engine aircraft. Welcome to Shortfield, a channel all about the lighter side of aviation. And today we're taking a look at the single engine pilot's worst nightmare, engine failure. So buckle up, because here we go. From the early days of learning to fly, you are taught to always be thinking ahead of the aircraft and in having a plan B or even C if things don't go as intended. And before you ever get to go solo, you are taught to expect the worst and always think that that whirly thing in front of you could stop spinning at any moment. Modern aircraft engines are very reliable and with proper maintenance and careful handling they can remain 100% reliable throughout their useful life. But there's a myriad of reasons why that propeller might stop turning partially or even completely and it's not all about mechanical failure. Carb icing, foul plugs, wrong mixture setting or just general fuel starvation through vapour lock or water contamination are all reasons that the donkey might quit even though the actual engine is perfectly serviceable. Survivability is highly likely but not guaranteed once the thrust is lost, but there's plenty you can do to prevent and mitigate from it happening and if it does, to put the odds in your favour. So let's take a look at the different phases of flight and how we should approach and deal with them if the worst happens. Our first line of defence against engine issues is to make sure we carry out our pre-flight checks meticulously. It's always good to start your checks by looking at the journey or tech log and seeing if anyone's made any entries regarding issues they have had in recent flights. It's also good to try and talk to the last person who flew the plane if it wasn't you. When examining the aircraft, always use the checklist, paying special attention to oil and fuel levels and always sump the fuel drains for water. I like to sniff the fuel and hold the tester against the white of the aircraft fuselage to assess for any contaminants and to ensure the fuel is the colour I'm expecting. Once the engine has started, follow the gauges throughout the warm up, looking for anything that seems different. If the aircraft hasn't flown for a while it may be a bit lumpy or difficult to start, but resist the temptation to try and clear it with high throttle settings until the engine has come up to temperature. While taxiing, try to be gentle with the throttle and study the gauges to ensure the pressures and temps are where you would expect them to be and if you have any doubts, turn around and head back to the apron to check it out. Complete your run-up into wind to aid cooling and follow your aircraft's run-up checklist to the letter. Ensure the engine is running smoothly and that all the temperatures and pressures are where they should be. If you have more than one fuel tank, switch to another tank before powering the engine up for the run-up. But if you forget, don't switch tanks just as you line up. Stay with the one you did the run-up with. Always follow the POH, but in a normally aspirated engine, make sure the car heat is used as much as possible and don't forget to close it before takeoff. Make sure you have a point on the runway where you abandon the takeoff if you are not at 75% of rotation speed, but still have enough room to stop either completely or at least be at a very low speed before braking by the end of the runway. If you are at a familiar airfield, you should have some suitable areas within 30 degrees of the runway that you have ingrained to memory where you can put the plane if you were to suffer an engine failure shortly after takeoff. If you are at a field you are unfamiliar with, you should use Google Maps to seek out areas around the field where it may be possible to go if the worst happens when, when you're doing your pre-planning. Also, looking out for these areas when you do your overhead joint to land is also a good idea. You should have your vital actions committed to memory for an engine failure after takeoff and try to practice with an instructor regularly. Most pilots only do this on their flight review, but you should try and practice more often if you can. Once in the cruise, good engine and fuel management means a failure in this phase of flight is pretty unlikely, 
However, fuel contamination not picked up on the pre-flight checks or a poor mixture setting or even a catastrophic failure is always a possibility which could mean that the engine may start to run poorly or even stop altogether. As you fly along your planned route, try and make a mental note of nearby airfields. I like to try and spot them, then check them on Skydemon and even say to myself, that's Top Farm over there or there's Headcorn. The one benefit you do usually have if the engine were to stop in the cruise is height above the surface, which buys you time, but nevertheless, before you do anything else you need to not panic and get the aircraft in its best glide configuration. Scan the area for somewhere suitable to land and if time allows, use your nearest function on your GPS. You never know, you could be right over an airfield that you didn't notice. Go through the rest of your vital actions and attempt to restart. If it were a leaning issue or temporary fuel starvation or contamination, it will possibly start again. However, if it's obvious that the engine has failed catastrophically, for example oil on the cowling and windscreen, it may be better to just accept the failure and put all your concentrations into a safe landing. The aircraft will glide differently to any practice engine failure you've done in training with just an idling engine and depending on whether the propeller stops completely or just windmills will have an effect on the glide ratio but you must just fly the aircraft at the best glide speed. If you go for an off field landing use the five S's to establish if the area is suitable. The first S is size. Assess the size. Is it big enough for you to get into? The second S is the shape. Look at the shape. Will it allow you to land into the wind and what will be your best approach direction? Third S is surroundings. Are there large trees or buildings around that would stop you getting a clear approach or perhaps a river running through it? Fourth S is the slope. Is the field flat or is it sloped? And if it is, can you land uphill? And finally, the fifth S is the surface. Are there tall crops or are there animals in the, in the field or is it freshly ploughed which may cause the landing gear to dig in and flip you over? Try and select your field as quickly as possible and if you are satisfied that your chosen field is suitable, try to visualise a simple pattern which will leave you a beam your chosen touchdown point with enough height to allow you to do a gentle descending turn onto a short final. Use the turn to lose any excess height but never let the airspeed drop below your best glide speed. Don't try and drag out any glide and keep your turns at a maximum of rate 1 but fly the aircraft all the way down to the ground. Use your flaps if available to control your speed once you know you'll make your landing zone. Make sure your seatbelts are tight and unlatch the door if possible. I find the best way to remain confident about off airfield landings is to fly into short awkward strips as much as you can. Keeps the skills up and current should you be forced into a field one day and this is especially helpful if you mostly operate from a long hard runway. If you are flying in IMC at night or over water you may need to take slightly different actions but whatever you do just keep flying the plane. It's always safer to fly a high approach, keeping the airfield within gliding distance for as long as possible when on final, but don't be so high that you risk overshooting the runway. Use car P if required by the POH and try to reduce the power slowly as big power changes can cause the engine to hiccup or even stop, plus it's not good for the engine and may cause shock cooling. Once over the numbers, the threat from a failure diminishes, but if you need to go around again, try not to immediately firewall the throttle, but increase it positively but gently. A sudden rush of fuel into the engine could cause problems. So that does it for this time. Have you ever suffered engine failure, full or part, and what was the outcome? Or do you fly defensively to mitigate against it? For example, by not flying at night or not in IMC, and have you any advice for the methods you use? Please pop your comments in the section below. I'd love to hear about your thoughts, experiences or recommendations and I try to read every comment. Thank you so much for watching. Making this video has been a real eye opener. If you'd like to see more content like this, please consider subscribing and don't forget to hit the notification bell so I can let you know next time I upload a video. Oh, and if you like this video, you'll love the video I did on the little sport cruiser. Why not watch this one next? 
Hopefully you found this video interesting and helpful, but please note I am not an instructor and any information you get from this video is all based on my personal experience as a private pilot in the UK. Fly safe guys and short field out.